Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper. August is in full swing and we know this from all the canning of the summer vegetables and also back to school. Amanda went back to school today with an in-service training at Clemson's Edisto Rec, but she'll be back next week, so I'm going to be hosting the show tonight. Good evening, gardeners. I'm Vicki Bertnolly, Clemson Extension Agent in Aiken and Lexington Counties. I'm joined tonight by a great panel, Amy Dabbs and Morgan Judy Sass. Join Teresa Lott in the chat room for lively conversation. And also, Dr. John Nelson is going to try to stump the panel with his weekly mystery plant. Laurie Akers, our special guest from Earth Fair Columbia, and we're going to be making some wonderful back-to-school no-bake granola bars. Also, our featured segment is going to be visiting uh, Andy Cave from Riverbanks Zoo and Garden. So let's go inside and say hi to everybody. Hi, Teresa. It's nice to see you over there. I've heard some wonderful things going on in Florence County that you guys had um, some great um, rain barrel experiment going on and that it's actually working very well. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, good evening, Vicki. That is right. We do have a demonstration project going on in downtown Florence. It's a cooperative project between the Florence Darlington Stormwater Consortium and Keep Florence Beautiful. So we're using rainwater collected from a downtown building to irrigate a semi-newly formed green space in downtown. A great way to show off to everyone how you can use rainwater harvesting at home. It is on a homeowner scale and big thanks to Brian Smith who came down from Lawrence on Friday to spend the day uh, in the heat and humidity installing the solar panel and pumps to get those rain barrels and irrigation functioning. You know, last week we had a very special guest on Making It Grow, Dr. Della Baker, who told us all about Clemson's centennial for the Cooperative Extension Service. You can join in that celebration every day with Clemson's 100 years photo of the day. Go to clemson.edu slash extension slash 100. I know that's a lot to remember. Click on the photo of the day. You'll see today's featured photo is about youth livestock. There's still lots of opportunities today for youth to get involved in agriculture and and animals. I know just recently 4-Hers in the PD uh, learned about showing goats with the Goat Showmanship Clinic getting ready for the Eastern Carolina Agricultural Fair. I hope that you are thinking about joining me in the chat room this evening. We hope it's an easy process. Go to the Making It Grow Facebook page. It does have a little different look lately, so you're going to want to look on the left-hand side of the screen for the green Let's Talk icon. Once you click there, you should be directed into the chat room where we already have eight speakers, no viewers, so everybody's ready to join in the conversation. You can log in and you can be chatting with us just momentarily. Vicki, back to you. Thank you, Teresa. And now we're going to say hi to one or two of my very wonderful favorite, favorite people. Mm -hmm. um, we've got former Extension agent uh, Morgan Judy Sass, uh, who is now with Ag South Farm Credit. And what's been going on with you in Orangeburg? Well, Vicki, I'm so glad to be here, especially here with you and Amy, two of my favorite gardeners. But um, <laughs> I work for Ag South Farm Credit in Orangeburg. We're an agricultural lender. 
Uh, my role has changed a good bit. I analyze loans now, but I'm still a gardener and I still love to learn about gardening and talk about gardening. So I'm so glad to be here today. Are you still getting phone calls from your friends and things about, <laughs> Occasionally. about gardening? Occasionally. <laughs> now everyone in my office just asks me their gardening questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're the in-house expert. We have Amy Dabbs here from Charleston County. What's been going on down in the low country? Lots of rain, Vicki. Uh, <laughs> lots of flooding. I think there's a, a photo uh, circulating right now of someone on a, um, on a uh, personal watercraft going down one of the <laughs> flooded streets of the city. So it's been a little, uh, little rainy, but um, we're ready for a nice dry fall and, and good weather again. So oh, wonderful. Thanks wonderful. for having me. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. And our special in-house guest is Laurie Aker from Earth Fair. Hi, Laurie. Hey, how you guys doing? The back to school season is finally here, and it's always nice to have a quick and easy recipe to turn to when it comes to keeping the lunchbox both healthy and interesting. Now tonight, we're gonna show you how to prepare some no-bake granola bars, which is perfect for kids of all ages. So we're gonna go ahead and get started, and when we come back, we'll show you how to put these together step by step. You won't wanna miss out. Thanks, Laurie. And we're going to take some phone calls in a second, but first we have a sneak peek of our um, visit to Riverbank Zoo with Andy Cabe. I'm Vicki Burtonolly, Clemson Extension Agent, Aiken and Lexington Counties, and I'm here with Andy Cabe of Riverbanks Garden and Zoo, and we're talking about one of the amazing plants he has here in the garden. What is this one that we have here, Andy? This is uh, Cynara cardunculus, or commonly known as cardoon. Uh, we grow this primarily for winter interests. We're always looking for something that's got big, bold texture in winter. That seems to be something that, that oftentimes lacks with, with winter annual sort of things. Cardoon is a perennial, but we treat it as an annual in, lot, in, in lots of settings. If we're doing displays, we may use it as an annual, but it'll get big in, in you know, a single growing season. And so it grows all throughout the winter. And then as it starts to get hot, usually in June or July, it starts to kind of melt a little bit. And we'll just cut it back and let it go dormant uh, for the rest of the summer. It does flower, but we grow it primarily for the foliage. It has beautiful purple thistle-like flowers. But so yeah, it's pretty, just a pretty neat plant. Uh, always gets lots of, lots of questions about it in the garden. So Andy, this is a really neat plant, and I think people might want to have it in their own gardens. How would folks go about finding this? Check your local garden centers in the fall, about the time when you're buying pansies and ornamental vegetables for the winter. That's usually a good time to find cardoons. Wonderful. Now, are there different varieties, or is this, is this usually what, it's, what they're going to find in the garden center? There are a couple of different varieties. This is one called Porto Spineless. A lot of cardoons have spines uh, along the, along the midrib of the leaf. This is a spineless variety, but most of them have this same general appearance. Oh, wonderful. It's a beautiful plant to have in the garden. Very striking and, and very unique. Wonderful. Well, thank you very, very much. Thanks, Vicki. I just thought the cardoon was one of the neatest plants out there. It was so large and just it, it really filled in the space out there, so I really enjoyed the visit. Um, and we're going to, I want you to stay tuned later because we're going to have um, a more detailed visit um, whenever Amanda talks to Andy um, a little bit later on. Um, but right now we've got our first caller, and this is going to be Lynn from Welford. How are you, Lynn? Doing good. And what's your question? Okay, this is for my dad, and it probably might sound like a crazy question, but he <laughs> keeps wanting to know, how can you grow a seedless watermelon without a seed? Okay. I know it sounds crazy. It's not crazy. It's not crazy at all. Um, Amy, do you have any insight on how we grow a seedless watermelon well, without any seeds? Um, not too much other than I know there's lots of hybridization that goes on in uh, seedless water watermelon production and nowadays we even have grafted watermelons um, that help with that so I think there's a couple ways to go about it if I'm not mistaken. And the seedless watermelons are not actually seedless there are seeds in, in, the, in the watermelon they're just oh they're so not yeah. as large. I don't know about what she, if you so, so this is the, probably uh, easier if we go to the garden center and go ahead and buy yeah. starts than trying to start them from seeds well, ourselves. and you have to have certain pollinators it's, it's a little more complicated yes. than just growing a seeded watermelon you have to have certain plants that produce the fruit and certain plants that are the pollinators so you'd really have to do your homework and make sure you had the right varieties okay um, mm -hmm. Lynn I think we've got we've got wonderful fact sheets on on Clemson's HGIC about growing watermelon so that might be something that she wants yes. to check also. <laughs> All right, next we have Pam in Asheville. How are you, Pam? I'm fine, thank you. What's your question? 
Okay, it's a two-part question about tomato plants. They're beefsteak tomatoes, mm-hmm. and uh, I planted them. They grew really well. They're they're over five feet tall. Oh wow! It, and the the tomatoes are growing, but they've stopped. Um, they want to just stay green, and some of them are rotting because the the foliage is so thick. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to know: should I thin them out and just save what I can, or should I just pick them and put them in the sun and let them turn red. All right. And what's your second question? Well, that was it. Should that I was pick it? them or should okay. I thin it out? So she's got beefsteak tomatoes and, and they're kind of stalled out mm-hmm. now and she's kind of wondering what to do with them. Um, Morgan, do you have any ideas to well, help It sounds them? like the plant is very healthy. It's just not producing, if I understood that correctly. So it could be over fertilization. Maybe the plant is putting all its effort into growing foliage and not fruit. Uh, another thing that came to mind is just when it gets so hot outside, sometimes the, the blooms aren't viable or they don't pollinate, and uh, they may not be actually pollinating properly just because of the heat. I think, she's, yeah. I think she probably has fruit. They're just not turning green, and yeah. I've had a few it clients like with the same thing. It sounds like they've stalled out, just thing. not going yeah. anywhere. And I think part of it is, you know, they probably were all ripen around the same time because that's one of those older varieties, and so they all kind of come on at once and, you know, har- and will ripen maybe. I don't know. I haven't really seen that before, but I've had a few clients with that. So. Now, we know that, that tomatoes kind of stall out about mm-hmm. 90 degrees, 95 degrees. And, and but I don't know if it's been that hot in Nashville. Yeah. yeah, maybe okay. too much cloudy sure. days. Okay. I don't know if they've been having as much rain as we have. Alrighty, I, I actually think we addressed that question. There might be something on our Facebook page okay. just recently. I'll take a read up on that. All right, our next caller. We've got Alton in Myrtle Beach. Alton, how can we help you? I got one question. Um, I, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, I got this question. But um, I see you talking about. Uh, I hear you talking about. Uh, uh, South Carolina onions is supposed to be as good as the Valdelli onions, mm-hmm. and uh, I've never, I, I wish you could tell me what the name of them is, where you can find them, where you can buy the seeds, or whatever. All righty, Alton's wanting to know about, it sounds like, South Carolina sweet onions. Mm-hmm. Um, Morgan, do you know anything about those? And he wants to know how to get them. Yeah, I've known people that have grown them in the area where I work. Um, I know that there are certain varieties that have been patented, but as far as where to buy them, I'm not sure. Um, that's a really good question. Is, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've never, I'm, I'm the never sweet seen ones either. Seed for I think sale. you can find Carolina sweets at the farmers market, probably. Yeah. Yes, um, I would think so. Um, and probably I, some I of the farmers. I believe they're called Carolina sweets. That's one um, name that I'm familiar okay. with. I would some look of the feed online, and seeds. just the local seed sources, maybe see if they have them. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now we are going to check in with Teresa in the chat room. Teresa. Thanks, Vicki. Well, we're having a grand time in the chat room, as always. We're up to 14 speakers and four viewers. Those people who are just viewing the conversation, we'd love to have you take part. Even if you feel like you don't have any expertise to share, you can always ask your question. Uh, It's hard to imagine, but it's time to start planting your fall garden. Some things maybe even should have been planted already, depending on where you are in the state. So someone asked about when they should plant turnip greens. And I always defer to the planning a garden fact sheet. You can find that on the Home and Garden Information Center, clemson.edu slash hgic. That's a mouthful. Uh, Just type in planning a garden should be the first thing that pops up and it's going to divide the state into geographic regions and tell you the planting dates per vegetable crop for that specific area. So wonderful resource there. Definitely take advantage of that. Vicki, back to you. Thanks, Teresa. Um, And Morgan has brought us it looks like a butternut squash. What's going on with this with this squash, and why have you brought it to us? It is a butternut squash, and actually there's nothing wrong with it, which is a good thing. But uh, the reason I brought it is I wanted to try to show people when it was proper time to pick butternut squash. Okay. Uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to tell because once they start growing, they pretty much keep the same color. Uh, but one thing you can look at is a butternut squash that's immature will oftentimes have these green stripes. I don't know if you can really see them on the screen. But green stripes coming out from where the stem attaches to the fruit. Mm -hmm. And as long as the green stripes are there, the plant is still maturing. So once those green stripes are gone, then the plant is mature enough to pick. Another thing you can do is you can do a fingernail test, and you can see if your fingernail will dent the skin. And if you can make an indention, it's probably not right. Now these you can pick when they're still immature. I actually had one last night. Um, they're just not as orange inside, and they're not quite as good. But you can still eat them when they're immature, but if you 
if the plant's healthy and you can leave them on the vines a little bit longer, I would. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you, Morgan, yeah, for bringing welcome. that. And we're going to check in with Dr. John Nelson via Skype. Dr. Nelson, how are you tonight? Well, Vicki, I'm doing very well, and I hope you are. It's nice to hear your voice. Well, thank you. And we see Rosie and Hannah in there. Hello, girls. Uh, we wish we could see you all, but uh, <laughs> I can't really see you. <laughs> well, we all look wonderful, I'm telling you. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure you do. Well, so what, how's everything? It's going wonderfully. What do you have for us this week? Well, <clears throat> tonight we have a plant that I've been seeing for the last uh, week or so uh, as I ride my bike to work. I'm really fortunate in that I'm close enough to the university that I can ride my bike um, pretty frequently. And I've been seeing this plant um, in my neighborhood. It's just gorgeous. Now, for those of you who like to grow native trees, this is one of them. This is an evergreen tree that's about, it can be about 30 feet tall. And it grows in um, damp uh, ecosystems such as uh, Pocosins and um, shrub bogs on the coastal plain. And every now and then it gets into the Midlands. It has um, really cool flowers. The flowers are almost as big as the palm of your hand. Oh, wow. Uh, five beautiful white petals. And uh, they open up from a, a bud that looks sort of like a big white ping pong ball. Very pretty. And then there's a whole bunch of stamens on the inside of the flower. Mm -hmm. And then after this thing finishes blooming, the petals will fall off all in one piece. If, if you can imagine that, that the whole uh, um, collection of petals, of course, we call that the corolla will fall off of the tree and land on the ground mm -hmm. and it'll take the petals um, it'll take the stamens with it okay and uh, this tree um, you, I, I don't know why it isn't grown more commonly it's just wonderful and uh, like I say it's it's evergreen so it provides um, um, well in the summer it's, a, it's great for shade but also for the uh, color of the flowers beautiful against that dark green foliage and that the bark is smooth, and um, if you want something that's evergreen for the winter time, you know that works for that real well too. Now, are these flowers fragrant? They sure are pretty. They are a um, little bit fragrant. They're they're quite nice. And um, I got to tell you all a couple of hints about this, I guess, but you probably know what it is. But it's a uh, um, it's actually a kind of a it's one of our bay trees. Okay what people call bay trees, you know, there's three different plants that have that name, bay, and this is one of them. Um, and um, I think this is actually the prettiest of the three. Um, and if you're trying to guess what the common name is, I just say that the, uh, <laughs> sometimes these plants grow where loblolly pines. <laughs> All right. Oh, I think that was a wonderful hint, John. I, I think Amy's Amy's been nodding the whole time, so I think I think she might know what it is. Um, do you guys have any guesses? Loblolly Bay. That's a, John a That's Loblolly Bay. Is. Yeah. That's a yeah. Oh, like, wonderful. Lots of them grow down in the Low Country where yeah. I live, so. So they yeah. do grow down there. But lots of horticulturists just call them gordonias. Okay. You know, just yeah. by the by the yeah. genus. Well, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, you do need to plant more of them. They are beautiful. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you, John, so much. Now, if folks want to get in touch with you, maybe send you a sample to have plants ID'd, how do they go about doing that? Well, they can um, <clears throat> get in touch with me. Uh, just call me up if, if, if you know, if you got a telephone. Or <laughs> send, me a, um, send me an email with a picture of your plant attached to it. That almost always works out real well. Or you could bring it by the office. And I, let me just mention that um, our herbarium has a brand new uh, issue of our uh, newsletter out. It's online, so you have to go to um, go to our website to find it. But That's the fluoroscope, right? The fluoroscope, and it's available online presently. Oh, wonderful! And I, I think it's actually um, it's been posted. You posted it on the Facebook page. R right, it got posted. Um, on the uh, Making It Grow um, Facebook page, so you can find it there. Well, thank you very, very much, and uh, and I guess we will talk to you a little bit later. Thank you, Dr. John. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye, John.
Our next phone call, we've got Sally in Charleston. Sally, how can we help you? Well, I'll tell you, about seven years ago, I planted a, a jessamine tree vine on, beneath my deck. It has completely taken over the railing on my deck, and it looks like a forest. And I'm wonder I hate to trim it because it's so beautiful when it blooms, but I'm afraid it's going to pull my deck down. Okay. How and when and where do I trim it? Okay. Um, you guys are nodding. Do y'all have any ideas about pruning a jessamine? Well, I don't, I mean, I think when it comes down to your house, you just have to, you know, take matters in your ha own hands and, and do it. And I don't think she's going to kill it if she, if she prunes it back. I've, you know, had very little luck actually killing one. So <laughs> I think she would be fine, you know, if she wanted to get in there. But, you know, she could wait um, a little for it to cool off a little bit if she okay. wanted to, to get in there and do some work because, you know, in Charleston and all gets it's a little hot and not a little little buggy so down in there. Yeah, maybe not stress it so mm -hmm. much, okay. and um, maybe she could put some uh, lattice work or some support for it to grow on as a as a trellis, you know, instead of just relying on the deck. But okay. it is beautiful and it, it's great for the hummingbirds in the spring. So I'm glad that she planted that for mm -hmm. for a uh, a beautiful spring preview. So, just yeah. imagine how pretty it is oh, having yes. a having a beautiful yes. wall like that. There's a fall bloomer too. Oh, is there? There is. There is a swamp uh, swamp jessamine. So that blooms in the fall. Very yes. nice. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. And next we have David and Manning. David, how can we help you? Yes, uh, thank you for taking my call. I really enjoy y'all's program every week. Oh, thank you very <laughs> much. I planted a little small garden. I have open. It's over eight feet tall. I'm picking okra every day off about ten plants. Oh, my goodness. I, plant, I planted a few. The secret to that is I got some turkey fertilizer from my son-in-law at Lynchburg, told some bomb turkey. But anyhow, I put that turkey fertilizer on it, maybe going everywhere. But anyhow, my main subject was I planted a few hills of colored butter beans. Okay. They, they are running everywhere. They're running all over my tomato bushes. They're running up the tomato and they're open bushes, but they have no blooms on them. Oh, goodness. Okay. I wanted to say over fertilize, and we've had quite a bit of rain, so I just wondered what the problem was. All righty. So um, David's got an issue where his butter beans are kind of taking over anything, but the bad thing is they're not producing anything. Mm -hmm. What do y'all think is going on? Maybe a little too much turkey fertilizer. Mm -hmm. okay. um, they sound like they might be over fertilized, and um, you know. But the good thing is we have had a lot of rain, so that will probably leach a good bit of that nitrogen out. And you can plant, you know, bush beans, butter beans, and and you know all types of beans in the Midlands and, and lower uh, parts of the state, you know, for quite a while now, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I think most of the fact sheets say to keep sort of plant them successively every two or three weeks so you have an ongoing crop. So I feel like he could try again maybe and, you know, um, get another an, another crop out of it before the, the, uh, before the cold before hits. the cold hits, the first frost, and just don't add any more fertilizer for okay. sure. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, we have another caller. This is Ray in Lancaster. What can we help you with, Ray? I, I have a problem with something eating my peas. It's just they just tear the hull up on my peas and eat the peas out of it. And you haven't seen any? You haven't seen any insects in there? No, I I don't. I hadn't seen. I hadn't seen. I hadn't seen a. I hadn't seen nothing. I hadn't even seen a bird or nothing. But it's They've eating. Been doing it. It's eating the whole They've pod, been, or eating the bean out of it. They just eat the bean. They tear the pod up and eat the bean out of it. Hmm. Okay. Well, he's got. A mystery uh, critter, critter <laughs> yeah. in his garden. Um, do y'all have any ideas of what may be going on? Um, I don't know. It sounds. I mean, it sounds like a pretty dexterous critter. <laughs> so maybe a squirrel or a bird that yeah. would, you know, would know to go after yeah. that, you know, sweet seed rather than yeah. just eating the whole thing. I think insects. Well, you're the entomologist, mm. so you know. Yeah, you it, can doesn't, maybe speak it, on doesn't it doesn't sound, sound like, like a, it's. It's not something small. It sounds like it might be something larger, maybe. I think, raccoons, I think critter wise, bird, or maybe something that um, is looking for that that nice bean treat inside there. Yeah, it doesn't really sound like an insect to me. Yeah. Um, but maybe some fencing or netting over yeah, them to see if they can just, just sort of dissuade whatever it is. Put up yeah. a bird feeder somewhere far away and lure them away. Okay. <laughs> um, now, Amy, you brought some things to show I us today. Did. 
Um, you know, I usually just bring pretty flowers from my garden, but, but it's... these look lovely like that. It actually looks like you brought a flower arrangement. Amanda could make this look like a pretty arrangement, <laughs> but um, these are mostly just weeds out of my garden um, that are really loving the rain. And um, we have these beautiful sedges. Um, sedges have edges, remember? It's mm -hmm. one of our uh, three one classifications of, of weeds. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, with all the rain that's going on, I know when it dries out, so too will the uh, the nut sedge population will drop in my yard. I don't have an irrigation system, so um, as you know, I live out in the country, so there's no need for that. Um, and then my least favorite weed, it's sort of wilty, um, is this little um, chamber bitter, which if I can get it, kind of tease it out of here, sort of looks like a uh, little mini mimosa tree, if you know what that looks like. And I don't know if they can get these little pods on here, but um, you'll also know if you have this that it has these little, um, they look like little berries or little uh, pods on the back. And mm -hmm. we were talking about this earlier. This is what makes this such a bear <laughs> is that every single one of those little pods, if you will, is actually a fruit that contains multiple seeds. Mm -hmm. So they're not individual seeds. They're multiple seed packages. And there's many, many, many of them on each uh, And this is a leaflet. major nursery weed. It's a we major have. weed everywhere, I exactly. think, in the low country. I don't know about other gardeners, but I hear a lot of gardeners complain. And this is one you have to really hit to control, really, with a one-two punch of, you know, a post-emergence. So hit it, killing it while it's up if you can, if it's somewhere where you can, can get to it. You know, you don't want to use a post-emergent herbicide in your turf grass, right. you know. But if you have it in a flower bed or in a ditch or a roadside, you could hit it uh, with a sort of a broad-spectrum, you know, weed killer. Then you'll, if you really have it bad, you'll need to do a pre-emergence to the next season, whether it be fall or spring or both, to control um, <laughs> all, those, gonna be both. <laughs> all the seeds that it uh, produces. And, you know, all these little fruit are, you know, very buoyant. So they float mm -hmm. in, all this, um, in all this rain mm -hmm. and uh, also through mowing and blowing activities. So if you get it and you don't control it, you'll be like me and have a bumper crop. So, <laughs> so. Now, with some of these, we've actually got really great fact sheets on the HD. I very see, good fact sheets. Um, the one on chamber bitter is excellent mm -hmm. um, and it's very, very helpful. We hand this out all the time. Yes. I'm sure you got, well, you don't anymore, but <laughs> I'm sure you do in your office. Hand Morgan wrote a great one on lawn burr weed, which yep. is a huge uh, lawn weed in sandy soils, uh, which she and has a bowman. About it. And Why mm -hmm. do you know about it? Because, because when you step on it with bare feet or pull it with a bare hand the first time, you'll never forget it. And that's usually <laughs> what brings people running to the office is a, a sore Paul, you know, <laughs> from grabbing a hold of it, but it's very, burrweed is a good, a good name for it, and you did a good job on that fact sheet. Well, thank so. you, and I always told people, once you step on it, it's too late. It's you can't <laughs> do anything that year. Yeah, and that's the yeah. issue whenever you're treating these weeds, um, you need to get them while they're young and actively growing and not already seeded mm -hmm. or flowered. Yep. And, and stuck in Which the is foot. pretty much yep. impossible to chamber better because by the time you see it, it already has seeds pretty much. So yeah. it's... Uh, it's a bear to deal with, yep, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we've got another caller. We've got Victor in Norris. Victor, how can we help you? I have a question about grass for poultry. Okay. How grass can I plant for my chickens? Good question. <laughs> I think that this might be a question um, better dealt with. Maybe we need to send this to a livestock agent. Um, I would say. And, you know, but I, I've had chickens in the past and I know they're very good. They'll eat all kinds of weeds, you know, but I don't know about a particular specific, type of grass that they would yeah. eat. So um, I think this might be something where um, you contact your local extension office and find out who the livestock agent is in that county and they can probably give you better suggestions um, than us guessing. <laughs> so I. All right. So next we're going to visit Laurie Aker at the side counter and um, prepare some of these wonderful, wonderful school snacks. Well, you know, it is the back to school season and we always want something that's nice and quick and easy, something for our families to jump right in, have the kids help in the kitchen. You know, I get so excited about some of the photos that get shared on the Making It Grow Facebook page. And this week uh, was no different. I got really excited when I saw this photo sent in by one of Sumter County's master gardeners, Carmen Jones. These happen to be monarch caterpillars. I have been uh, patiently waiting for them to arrive in my yard, but no such luck. You know, these guys, the larvae, the caterpillars, are very particular about what they eat. They will only feed on milkweed species. Uh, 
and we have been seeing a decline in monarch populations. One of the reasons might be due to habitat destruction. So if you enjoy seeing monarchs in your yard or any other butterflies, you want to be careful so that you plant not only adult nectar sources, but also larval host species like milkweed for monarchs. Now let's check in with Vicki and Lori at the side counter. And we've got Laurie here from Earth Fair Columbia, and we're going to make some wonderful snacks for our back-to-schoolers. Yes. Um, so tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. what we're going to do, and let's make something great. Yes, well, these are no-bake granola bars, and you know with the back-to-school season, we want a recipe that's quick and easy, something that kids can help in the kitchen with, and these bars are no exception. And again, there's no baking involved, so kids can definitely jump right and in. And that means it's something that I can on. do. Yes. <laughs> Because I'm horrible. I can't bake anything. Well, I burn everything. So this ready is right up started? my alley. Let's, yes. Let's, let's get started. Let's do it. So the first ingredient that we want to add is a little bit of puffed rice cereal. Now you want to make sure you're working with cereal that's unsweetened. And okay. we're using about two cups here. Okay. So we're going to add that right into a mixing bowl. And next, we're going to add in some old-fashioned rolled oats. Now, these are just out of the container. Out of There's, the container. They're not cooked. Or yep. Nothing's done to you them. You got it. Right okay. out of the box. And again, we're going to add about two cups directly into a mixing bowl. And I'm going to have you stir that okay. up for us. And we've got wonderful, wonderful products out here. It looks yes. like we've got some almonds. Yes, these are roasted almonds. Now, we're going to add about a fourth of a cup. Almonds, they add such a nice flavor, a okay. good crunch. And you can use the salted almonds or the unsalted almonds. And it looks Either like we need to break work. these up. It, it might be a little bit better than the whole ones. Yes, you okay. want to make sure that you crush those up. Um, the smaller they are, the better they're going to hold together with the other ingredients. Okay. So just take a rolling pin maybe with some parchment paper and crush those up um, into little bits like you see okay. there. And we've got sunflower seeds. Yes, you now, got it. Are these roasted or mm -hmm. are they raw? They are roasted okay. sunflower seeds and they are salted sunflower seeds. And again, we're working with about a fourth of a cup. Now okay. notice how we're adding all of our dry ingredients right into a large mixing bowl. And then... And we're yep. going to top it off with some sesame seeds. Sesame seeds, you got it. These have wonderful flavor and they're so pretty. Yes, and we're going to add about two tablespoons in okay. there. And again, just a dash, not too much. Okay. Um, and next, after our sunflower seeds. It looks like we need some color. Yes, we have some color for sure. We have some dried apricots and also some organic cranberries. Now, the great thing about this recipe, it's very versatile. You could pretty much uh, add whatever you Use like in there. Any kind of dried fruit. Any kind of dried fruit. We're adding okay. about a half a cup of each. And, um, Dried cherries work great for this recipe. Even okay. dried blueberries, papaya, mango. Again, anything you have in the pantry, you can toss right in. But we a probably don't want anything too soupy. Yeah, nothing too soupy. Okay. <laughs> but the uh, apricots and the cranberries are a perfect combination. Wonderful. Now, how is all this going to stick together? Well, we definitely need something to, to hold it together. So we mix some local honey out of Cottageville, South Carolina, about a half a cup, with some organic creamy peanut butter. And we are going to add this right into our mix. Now. Um, um, there's two ways you can do this. Mm -hmm. You can either put this in the microwave for about 20 to 30 seconds, okay. or you can cook it on the stove. You want to make sure not to boil it. It can burn okay. very, very easily. Um, so just a couple of minutes there to get a nice um, syrup consistency, and if you will. And this is something that the, the parents need to do, not the kids. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And it can get a little messy. I'll give you a fair warning there, but that's, that's part of the fun. Okay. And the great thing is, for those that have peanut allergies, you can actually use sunflower butter okay. or almond butter as okay. an alternative. Um, so there's definitely, um, a, you know, s some different ways of doing that. Oh, wonderful. Now, once you mix this up, you're going to take a 13 by 9 inch uh, baking dish mm -hmm. and you're going to put it on the bottom and take the palm of your hand and you're going to flatten it out until it's nice and even. And it's actually best to use your hands for this particular recipe. It just mixes a little better, but hey, we're... I think it's going to be yeah. more fun if we get messy. <laughs> you got it. So we're going to go ahead and finish this. Um, once you're done, you can actually add in some mini chocolate chips um, on top. Dress and it you up. can press them right on right on the top there. And okay. when they come out, they'll look something like this. And now how are we going to cut these? Mm -hmm. We're going to... Yep, yeah, what you'll do is you'll actually pop it in the fridge for about 30 minutes or so till they're nice and firm. Then you can take a pizza roller or just a traditional knife and cut them into squares. And if you want to get a little creative, kids can actually stamp them with cookie cutters for fun Oh, that shapes. makes them fun to eat. Yes, you got it. And they'll actually last up to a week if you put them in an airtight container like do a we need to Do we need to put them in the refrigerator or are they going to keep Nope, you can just keep on them the right on the counter. So it's you can make a big batch at the beginning of the week and kind of pull from them um, throughout the week. So they're perfect for the back to school season. Plus, we're using all natural and organic wholesome ingredients, so they're a little healthier than your average cookie. Oh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. I can't wait to try these. Yes, 
they are After delicious. The show. I'm gonna Thanks, add Lori. some chocolate on there. Now at the end of the show, <laughs> we'll get some contact information. Yep. I think you're gonna share the recipe with yes, us. Yes, we will have the recipe with photos, step-by-step -step instructions, so we'll give that towards the end. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Until then, we're <laughs> going to check in with Teresa in the chat room. Thanks, Vicki. My goodness, those granola bars look absolutely magnificent. And even though I don't have kids going back to school, I think that I can try them at home myself. I think anybody would enjoy that recipe. I have a little bit of trivia for you. This is sort of like a Where's Waldo photograph. Uh, this was submitted also on our Facebook page by Steve Adams. So hopefully you can recognize that there is an insect on this plant. This turns out to be our state insect, the Carolina mantid. It was chosen to be our state insect in 1988 uh, because of its important agricultural um, habit of controlling those pesky insects, the ones that cause plant damage because this one is a predator, or you might hear us refer to it as a good guy. So this is one that you want to welcome to your landscape, your uh, flower bed, or vegetable garden. Keep sending those photos. You know I enjoy getting them, and we do try our best to get back to you in a timely manner, but there's only a few of us, so please be patient. We do have other job duties to attend to, but we promise we will definitely get back with you. Vicki, back to you. Thank you, Teresa. And now we have another caller. This is Melissa in West Columbia. Hi, Melissa. How can we help you? Hey, I enjoy the show so much. Oh, thank you. Um, my question, my, you're welcome. My question is, I bought four hydrangea plants. They were about medium size last year. Mm -hmm. Planted them around my deck. Mm -hmm. And two have bloomed. They were all blooming at the time. Two have bloomed and two have not. Okay. What's the deal? What kind of hydrangeas are these? Are oh, these I mop didn't know pads or lace caps? Oh, are they blue or are they pink? Oh, right. they're right. kind of a blue, then they turn purpley. Okay, okay. And so um, Melissa's bought four hydrangeas. She planted all four of them. Two of them bloomed and two of them didn't. Well, there's quite a few things that could be going on. Um, you know, it could just be the first season, they've been in the ground, you know, maybe they had a little transplant shock, we had an awfully cold winter, maybe they, the buds were formed and they got damaged before uh, they bloomed. Maybe they were pruned incorrectly, you know, I don't, or not incorrectly, but she said they were blooming when she bought them, so they couldn't have been pruned at, pruned at the nursery. But there's a lot of things that could go wrong. But I would say to be patient, leave them in the ground, and um, I feel certain that they would bloom next year, especially okay. if the foliage is healthy and, uh, and they've had a good, uh, a good year in the ground, you know, at our house, settled in. They should, they should do just fine. Just don't prune them now, probably okay. would be, yep. you know. Okay, so just give it some time. Just give it some yeah. time. I have two of the exact same hydrangea bushes in my yard, but they're on opposite sides of my house. One is blooming. One's profusely not. right now, one's barely blooming at all. And I think it has a lot to do with sunlight, water. I think just they're mm -hmm. in two totally different areas. Little microclimates. Well. Yeah, and I think on. that's had a lot to do with it. Well, and like your house is sort of new and you've had some soil moving yeah. around. So, you know, they're maybe... playing at the exact same time, exact mm -hmm. same variety, but okay. they don't look anything alike. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very common. Yeah. That's that what we, we love have. about horticulture. Yeah. You never know what you're going to get. You know, it's always a surprise. Surprises. Yeah, yeah. surprises. <laughs> All right, our next caller, we've got Ann in Charleston. Hi, Ann. How can we help you? Hi, I um, have hydrangeas that we wanted to transplant. We actually had, uh, my husband finally took out some very scraggly looking um, that sasanquas. Uh, we live in a single house with a narrow driveway, and I was wondering about transplanting our, some hydrangeas that we just bought at the grocery store and have been had, have become big and put into containers, and whether we could put the, the hydrangeas in the the narrow, it's only a three foot um, wide along the driveway plot just to have some color okay. and go ahead and translate those in. Okay. So um, Anne's got a, a very narrow space um, and she's wanting to know if she can put those hydrangeas in that narrow space. What do you guys think? They're making faces. It probably wouldn't be my first choice, but just because of the pruning. What, what were you going to say, Morgan? <laughs> I was going to say, Ann, thank you for your call. I know Ann quite well. <laughs> I feel like this is a family, I don't know, a family matter. I'm going to step out of it now. Um, oh, we, we but, tell them why you know Ann. Ann is my mother-in-law. 
<laughs> Why didn't you ask me that on Saturday? <laughs> well, maybe maybe the plant might be a little bit too big for that space, and yes. it might not be happy in that space. Yes. Um, and they have a you know they're like most Charleston singles, you know, really tight um, you know driveway, tight walking space, and you know when you prune those hydrangea buds off, um, you know you lose your flowers for the next season. So so she might know, not get the color that she may thinks not get she's going to get flowers. in that spot. I'd it, pot it in a bigger pot. Yeah, and okay. there's a lot of moisture issues. You know, you don't know. Where the rainwater is falling, mm -hmm. I just feel like be it might be choice. a tough spot. But they are beautiful where they are. So. <laughs> I feel like this is going to require a trip for you to, to Charleston. So. You can visit your mother-in-law and then come visit me in the office. So. I think so. <laughs> All right. Well, now we're going to go um, visit um, Riverbank Zoo, mm -hmm. and we're going to watch Amanda um, and look around Riverbanks and talk to Andy Cabe um, there at Riverbanks Garden. South Carolina at Riverbank Zoo and Garden. I'm with Andy Cave, the director here in the Botanical Garden. Andy, this is not a static garden. What makes it move all the time? You know, we, we constantly are adding new things and, you know, pulling something up and, and, and planting something different back. You know, there may be, be some backbone and structure that stays here for a while, but we like to come in with, with new annuals and perennials and mix things in. You know, a lot of our, our different borders are themed. Um, you know, we have you know, perennial, different perennial borders, different shrub borders, and every so often we'll go in there and rip everything out and just totally redo it. You know, it's time for a change. We, we don't want to, you know, people to come in and continue and see, see the same plants over and over again in the same, you know, in the same kind of usage. So we, we like to change things up and keep it exciting. Andy, we're in the rose garden, and I think mostly you have old roses, and I'm going to ask you to tell me about that, but also you don't just have roses here, so how did you go about the design of this? Well, you know, this was designed a little before my time here, but their concept behind it was they wanted to use old heirloom roses for a few reasons. Number one, there's a lot of historical significance. You know, the, the Noisette class of rose originated down in Charleston, so we had a little local history with it, and also the old roses are much more disease resistant than some of our modern day hybrid teas. Um, and they have a lot more fragrance. It's amazing when people walk through this garden sometimes and they'll pass by and they'll catch a scent of this, this rose and say, oh, that's what I remember my mom's rose or my grandmother's rose smelling like. So there's a lot of fragrance in these old roses and the disease resistance. In the 17 years we've had this garden, old rose garden, we've never sprayed the roses for any insect or disease. So you can grow roses without spraying. If I come back in a couple of months, is it gonna look like a rose garden? It's, good. it's not going to look like your typical rose garden because one interesting thing about this rose garden is it's full of annuals, perennials, bulbs, trees, shrubs. We, we wanted it to, to have a little more of a casual feel, I guess, than some, you know, some formal rose gardens. So intermixed between all of these roses is a variety of plant. There's always something going on in the rose garden, even if the roses aren't blooming. We always talk about South Carolina being such a great place to garden. And you don't have to worry just about coming in the spring or fall. Even in the wintertime, I think there's, you've, you've got things going forever and ever. Yeah, people try to nail me down sometimes and say, well, when's the garden going to be in bloom? And I, and I explain to them that there's always something in bloom. You could come here 365 de uh, days a year and find something in bloom. Um, you know, certainly there, different areas have different peaks at times, but there's always something to see in the botanical garden. I know a lot of people who really do love to see the cutting edge kind of consider this the place to come to do that. And how do you keep up with all these new things and what are some of the new things that you've got coming in now? You know, there's, there's, so, there's so many new plants today. It really is hard to keep up and grow everything new. But uh, you know, luckily, thanks to a lot of plant explorers who go to different countries and bring things back, uh, we're able to get plants that way. And then you know, a lot of the breeding programs that are around now, uh, developing things like you know, exciting new elephant ears. There's so many cool elephant ears coming out every year, it seems like. And the popularity uh, hasn't waned at all with those. You know, there's a lot of new red buds coming out with uh, different foliage colors. Everybody's really focusing on foliage color now a lot. Uh, you know, there's a great red bud, uh, Circe's Rising Sun, that has chartreuse golden foliage. Uh, the same thing with one of the elephant ears, Colocasia Maui Gold. So we're getting lots of, lots of fun colors from things too. So it's not always about the flower, but it can be a lot about the foliage color too. 
Andy, when you've created a place this beautiful, I imagine it get used, gets used for other things besides just coming and enjoying the plants and flowers. Yeah, this is a really popular place for uh, people to get married. We probably do over 30 weddings a year in the garden. Also a very popular place for people to, to have meetings and, and evening, you know, evening functions and events. So we stay pretty busy here in the garden. It's just it's a nice, it's a nice backdrop for a lot of different things. And, and we always have all kinds of things going on in, in the zoo and garden during the day and after hours throughout the year. So it really is something to kind of constantly check back on the Riverbanks website and see what we've got going on. I see a lot of people here with their children, and I know they come to enjoy the zoo side, but also this side as well because it's friendly for people with children, lots of green grass for them to run around, and I think you're even going to expand on that. Absolutely. We're about to revolutionize the way kids use this botanical garden. This fall, we hope to break ground on our new children's garden. It's going to be a three-acre, $5 million facility geared just for children. It's kind of an opportunity for kids to have a good safe environment to play outside like we used to do running around as kids. There's going to be a, a man-made stream for them to play in. They'll be able to get in there and wait in there, pick up rocks, dam, dam the stream up, you know, change the water flow, play and have fun. There'll be a little pond that'll be a working ecosystem uh, where they'll be able to see fish and frogs and turtles and things like that. Uh, a series of uh, five tree houses that they'll be able to go from tree house to tree house. Uh, a beautiful new education center you know, we already have kids programs here, but it'll be a great way to expand upon that. There'll be a dinosaur dig where they'll be, they'll be able to get in the sand and excavate a skeleton of a dinosaur and lots more fun things involved. But look for that in the fall of 2015. If people want to keep up with the exciting things that are happening here, what's the best way to stay informed? A couple of easy ways to, to, to keep in touch with us. Uh, go to our webpage, www.riverbanks.org. There's all kinds of information about planning your visit there and other things we have going on. Also, feel free to become a fan of the Riverbank Zoo Facebook page. Lots of good information there as well. Well, I'm going to go right home and like you, and I want to thank you for letting us come and visit you today. My pleasure, Amanda. Thanks for coming out. It's always great seeing the zoo. Things are always changing and evolving there, and, and I can't wait to, to visit again very, very soon. Um, but now we've got another caller. We've got Victor and Jackson. Victor, how can we help you? Yes, I have these crepe myrtles in my backyard, and I introduced some canyons into my garden. And ever since I planted them, um, my crepe myrtles have got this moldy looking substance on it. I have crepe myrtles in my front yard, and they don't seem to have it. Um, I went to Adams Nursery in Barnwell, and he gave me a fruit spray okay. to spray on them. And um, I treated them. Um, and, they, you know, it says on the bottle to watch out for you don't want to kill your bees. Okay. So I quit treating them, and I'm just afraid to, to spray them. And I'm thinking I maybe I need to prune them back this winter and okay. treat them heavily then. Okay. All right, so Victor has some crepe myrtles, but they've got um, they've got some dark leaves on them. What's what's going on? Well, I'm wondering if he might not have powdery mildew because he said mildew. I guess it could also be sooty mold. I'm not sure if it's which one it is. Right. Um, but I do know that crepe myrtles are very susceptible to powdery mildew. And um, the fruit spray is really not. He needs a. The exact, no, it the sounds exact like right thing. It, yeah. If it says to protect bees, it's probably some type of insecticide when he needs a fungicide. Okay. Um, and in the future, if he plants any more crepe myrtles, there are powdery mildew resistant varieties. But unfortunately, once you pretty much have a crepe myrtle with powdery mildew, I'm not sure you're really going to get rid of it. Right. Um, it'll probably just cause the leaves to drop. And when the weather's so humid as it has been and damp, it's going to be more. The plants mm -hmm. are going to be more susceptible to it. So. So you probably got a different yeah. variety in the front yard and the backyard. Yeah, because there are resistant varieties. And I know on Clemson's website, they um, they list some that are 
We've resistant to powdery mildew. Yeah. So if somebody's looking to plant crepe myrtles, they might want to look at that. All right. And, and Victor, there's something else you can do. I'm the extension agent at Dakin County, and you can always bring some to me at the office, and, and we'll take a look at it, see if it's powdery mildew or see if it's city mold, um, just to, to make sure that you're using the correct uh, pesticide, even if you don't need one, um, even at all. So um, you're welcome to bring that in and, and have me look at it. Um, our next phone call, we've got Tina in Elgin. Tina, how can we help you tonight? Thank you so much. I enjoy your show oh, very thank you. much. Um, I have a problem with my canna lilies. Okay. I planted them. This is the second year. Mm -hmm. Of course, the first year they did very little growing, and okay. you know they didn't. I planted them from bulbs, but this year they're up big and tall. But it's like the leaves are sticking together, and they won't um, open up. And they wouldn't open up, so okay. I forced one and kind of like peeled it with my fingernail. Mm -hmm. And when I got it unrolled, it was really black and gritty. Yep. I didn't know if it was some type of eggs that were in it, or it, it just, it was real nasty. And of course, it makes all the green look horrible. Right. Well, Is an insect causing this? Well, I, I think these girls have an answer. Um, Amy, well, this is something This is really up your alley, but I can speak to it because I have it too, but canna leaf rollers, yep. and um, she's probably seeing, I guess she's seeing the, the, frass. Uh, the frass of the um, the roller in there, and they do, they make the, the, the leaves stick together, and if you leave it long enough, they sort of destroy them. They look pretty uh, raggedy and like they've been beaten, you know, and the leaves are kind of falling apart. Yeah, but it's, a, it's a caterpillar that's in there. Whenever she opens up the leaves, yeah. if it if it does open, mm -hmm. um, she's going to see holes in a row because the, they the leaf their was way rolled through. up. Yep. Um, but um, usually pretty easy to detect. And I think we've got a fact sheet yes. on um, cannas that mentions um, about canna leaf roller in there um, on Clemson's HGIC. I actually found so, a little... Uh, um, but now we're going to go and say thank you to Laurie Aker for helping us um, with some wonderful snacks for the kids. Um, and Laurie, tell us how um, folks can get in touch with you. Yep. Well, we hope you enjoyed our no-bake back-to-school granola bars. And for the complete recipe with step-by-step -step instructions and photos, you can visit us on our Facebook page at Earth Fair Columbia. And then for general information on Earth Fair and how we can help make healthy eating more accessible and more affordable for folks, you can visit us at earthfair.com. So thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed the recipe tonight. Thanks, Lori. Um, we've got a couple events that are happening around uh, South Carolina. The first one is the 2014 Southern Fruit Fellowship Annual Meeting. It's going to be held in Florence, um, and it's near McKenzie Farms. And uh, McKenzie Farms is one of the larger uh, uh, premier citrus farms in South Carolina. Stan McKenzie um, and Tony Melton are going to be hosting that. Um, some of the, the things that they're going to be doing, they're going to be touring a commercial kiwi, peach, and citrus operations. They're going to visit Moore Farms Botanical Garden. And there's also going to be a presentation from a wild fruit expert and also an entomologist. And the way you find more information about that is visit um, southernfruitfellowship.com, all one word. Um, and that's coming up soon in Florence. And then um, also a wonderful symposium that you can register for and attend. This is the South Carolina Midlands Master Gardeners Association 24th Annual Gardening Symposium. It's called Gateway to Gardening Tomorrow and Beyond. And that's going to be Thursday, October 23rd from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And for more information, you can call 803-520-520. 7437 or you can visit the Midlands Master Gardener Association website at scmmga.org. Now, Teresa, thank you so very, very much for manning the chat room tonight and I hope to see you very, very soon. It's always my pleasure to be here on Making It Grow and to have lively discussions in the chat room. Um, I think we got somewhere around 25 folks in there at one time, so uh, lots of lively discussion going on, questions, answers, suggestions, all kinds of interesting things going on. Although I hear that it's probably storming back in Florence, so I bet I have a terrified dog shaking at my laundry room door right now. But it's a great opportunity to harvest that rain and save it up for when we don't have plentiful rains and use it to irrigate whatever your herbs, your vegetable garden, or your flowers. Save up your rainy days. Vicki, back to you. 
Thanks, Teresa. Um, quickly, Louise, we have um, you have a comment about the peas. Yes. What is your comment, Louise? Oh, for the gentleman who's having a problem, it's grasshoppers. Oh. Okay, that could be a really yep. good suggestion. They have been really bad this summer in my yard. So yep, I've got several it. phone calls about them. Mm -hmm. Well, wonderful. Thank you, mm -hmm. Louise. Um, now, I want to thank Morgan for coming up here. So very, very much for coming and, and being on this panel, the all-girl panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I enjoyed being here, and I'm always glad to come and learn from everybody and learn from our callers. We enjoy having you here. And Amy, same to you. We love thank having you, you here. Thank you so much for keeping me company. Thank you so much for having me, Vicki. All right, we've got um, SCETV's Your Day program. Um, it's SCETV Radio at noon on Monday, August 18th. We've got Drink What You Grow. Um, Dr. Bob Polumsky is going to speak with the author, um, Nan Chase, about small plot gardening, edible landscaping, and drinking, um, making drinks from what they grow, which I think fun. will be wonderfully interesting. Thank Bob's you. Bob's always fun. And um, we also have um, South Carolina's agriculture, um, Angela Halfacre, author, professor, and um, the founding director at Furman University's um, David Shaw Center for Stain Sustainability um, has got, um, going to explore the culture of foods that Southerners love, and Southerners do absolutely love their food. That's right. So thank you so much for joining us tonight on Making It Grow, and we'll see you very, very soon. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.